Hack Lectures for 2020. I just have a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, one is bathrooms, which are out the back there and along the corridor. The other one is emergency exits. If we get an alarm of some sort, there are four. Down, two down here and two at the back. So if you go out those and just follow the green signs until you're well clear of the building to assemble. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, so to start us off, we have um, Doug Elliff, the Deputy Dean of Science, to open the series for us. Thanks very much, Paul. Good evening, welcome. Uh, so as Paul says, uh, my name's Douglas Elliff, and, and it's my privilege as uh, Deputy Dean of the, Sci of the Faculty of Science to welcome you to now the fourth edition of the annual EHACA lecture series. Uh, these lectures honour Ross E. Hacker, who I'm sure needs no introduction to most of you, as, as uh, one of the founding fathers of our, or founding parents of our, I should say, these days. Uh, I'll just say that Ross may well be the most influential member of, of the faculty ever, uh, given this uh, software, and we're all very proud of his achievements. This year's lecture series will highlight the role of statistics and statistical computing in the social sciences and public policy. So we all know that we're increasingly measured and quantified in our own everyday lives, and that how we will measure the outcome has become almost a mantra for um, any policy initiative that we might be looking to introduce, including within uh, the university. So the idea that if, if we can't measure it, it can't be in, in, important has become part of our lives. Though I do, I want, do want to say that I think we need to fight the converse version continually, which is that if we, can, if we can measure it, it must be important. That's, of course, not necessarily true. So social scientists, political scientists, behavioural economists and uh, psychologists, which includes me, although I'm not allowed to say that legally because I'm not a registered psychologist, we all work in, in situations where the application of quantitative methods is hard. It's a difficult thing to do. And this is because it's hard uh, to decide what we should measure, how we should measure it, and how to analyse the data once we've measured them. It's not simply because we, we tend to be rotten mathematicians, although that's probably part of it. The problems are actually difficult problems, hard problems. So consider, for example, evaluating interventions to reduce the road toll. First sight, that looks like an easy thing to measure, how many people died on the roads last year, but is it? Should we equate for distance driven or for time spent on the road? Should we compare rush hour versus night driving, city versus country, occasional long trips or regular short, short commuting trips? Is it the case that young drivers have, have more accidents and more deaths because they're actually more dangerous or is it because they have less money so they can't afford safer cars? How can we use the data to inform policy in, in the face of this kind of complexity and multiple causation? That's what I hope we'll learn something about. The 2020 uh, EHACA lecture series is going to bring together three renowned ex experts to discuss the challenges and the rewards of applying data science to societal issues. It was my pleasure to introduce the series, but it's even more my pleasure to stop talking now and to introduce the chair for the first lecture, Barry Mill. Thank you, Barry. Hi, I'm, uh, thanks Doug. Hi, I'm Barry Milne, Director of the Compass Research Centre here at the University of Auckland. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Simon Jackman to give the first IHAKA lecture for 2020. Uh, Professor Jackman is Chief Executive Officer of the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. Prior to that, he spent around 20 years at Stanford University as a political scientist, while also having a position in the Department of Statistics. He first graduated from the University of Queensland before earning doctorates from the University of Rochester and Princeton University. Uh, for many years, Professor Jackman served as one of the principal investigators of the American National Election Study, uh, the world's longest running and most authoritative survey of political behaviours and attitudes, and one that has corollaries here in New Zealand and where we ourselves at Compass are going to be helping running that later in the year, and there's also one in Australia. Um, and uh, he directed the project over both the 2012 and the 2016 the presidential election cycles, both of which very interesting elections, and the one coming up is going to be very interesting as well. His current research focuses on the opportunities and challenges of web-based survey research, the political and scientific consequences of underrepresenting hard-to-reach populations in social research, and developing methodologies for assessing the partisan symmetry and fairness of electoral redistricting. 
In fact, in 2016 and 17, Professor Jackman served as an expert witness to help secure the first successful uh, legal challenge in decades to partisan gerrymandering in the United States. In 2013, uh, Professor Jackman was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Scientists. He's a past president and fellow of the Society for Political Methodology. And in 2018, Jackman uh, was elected to the Academy of the Social Scientists in Australia. In his uh, eHaka lecture today, Professor Jackman will uh, examine recent successes and failures of predictive models of election outcomes, and will also discuss trends and discontinuities in the evolution of public opinion over election campaigns, as well as spatial, spatial smoothing and pollster biases. His lecture today is entitled The Triumph of the Quants, Model-Based Poll Aggregation for Election Forecasting. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Simon Jackman. Thank you, um, and what a great initiative um, of this statistics department. Um, I wake up every morning and I have to remind myself that um, I'm a CEO of a think tank that focus on, focuses on foreign policy and Australia's relationship with the United States and the region, because if I don't re remind myself of that, I go straight into R, and, and that's where I'll spend the rest of the morning until other matters uh, uh, come to work, um, come to play. Um, but, um, you know, um, statistical computing has been a part of my life since I was 14, um, when I was analysing my first surveys in BASIC on an Apple IIe, just to give you some clue of how old I am. And then, as a youngster in Australia, in Queensland, it was very difficult to find an outlet for that set <laughs> interests and skills, and, um, but I was very fortunate, and um, uh, some American-trained uh, political scientists suggested if you took data and political science seriously, that intersection really gets pursued seriously at the PhD level in the United States. And so off I went to the United States for what I thought would be a couple of years, and it's a familiar story to a lot of academics in the room. And uh, 20 years later, I, 25 years later, found my way back to Australia. Um, <clears throat> while I was in graduate school, uh, computing, statistical computing, went from being something you did on a mainframe down in the basement on a monochrome green monitor and became something you did on the desktop. And, and that transition was enabled by uh, SNS Plus uh, for me, again, dating myself. Uh, and and SNS came on a stack of about 20 uh, floppy disks that you'd spend all morning. And then, and then later on, um, along, not long after, along, along came R. I had the pleasure of serving on the um, Scientific Advisory Committee for a USAR conference that was in Vienna. And then ours just exploded. And again, just stepping back to my other world, running a think tank where we focus on conflict and relations between countries. R is, um, R is one of those international things. Um, the whole world <laughs> uses R, um, um, irrespective of uh, what side of a political divide or an alliance, or democratic or authoritarian tradition you might be on. Uh, and it's a great gift that uh, came out of this place. And so when I was asked to come here and give this lecture, particularly on the theme this year, uh, I jumped at the opportunity. And uh, so thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's a, just a great, great pleasure, great thrill to put this talk together for you guys today and to start off the lecture series uh, for this year. The triumph of the quants, and the title has a question mark after it, <laughs> um, um, which I think is important, um, as, as, we'll, as we'll get into. But this work that I've been doing now, I first got interested in this problem in the 2000 election in the United States, um, where one of my colleagues at Stanford had started up a, um, a survey research company with the novel idea of doing surveys online. And he said, would you come and just look at the data as it's coming in in real time and maybe just see if it's going to be any good as a prediction of the election outcome. And we've got so much data because it's online, we're going to get state by state samples here or enough data to plausibly do that. And you, could, you, know, you might think about predicting the election at the state level out of the polls we're doing, or at least just you know, having a play. And I went, oh, that sounds like a fun summer gig. And, um, and he paid me a little bit for it as well. Um, and so off I went, and that's where I first got interested in this problem. 
Um, little did I know that there was millions to be made. Uh, this guy called Nate Silver came along about four or eight years later and, and, and showed, and this is the point of, of the talk, and of this anecdote, showed that there's just so much public interest in this type of work that the public has an intense interest in wanting to know who's, who's up, who's down, who's winning, and particularly after the 2000 election in the United States, which reminded Americans vividly before the 2016 election, there was the 2000 election, that you could win the vote nationally but lose the presidency because of this peculiar mechanism in America called the Electoral College. And that, forget the national polls, it was really state by state numbers are the ones you um, needed. And since that election is coming up on 20 years ago, let me remind some of the younger people in the room uh, what happened that election. Um, Al Gore won more votes than George W. Bush but won them in the wrong places in such that he didn't win them. And with a little bit of an assist from the Supreme Court that gave the state of Florida and uh, shut down the vote count and handed the, um, the, the result in that state, awarded the result in that state to, to Bush, um, was uh, sort of the first time in, in a century or more that we'd had that mismatch. That was always theoretically possible a mismatch between the national vote, the, the tally of the votes at the national level, the, the quantity that the polls were tracking, and actually how the election is decided, an American presidential election, there are a series of state-by-state winner-take-all contests, essentially. And so instead of tracking one number, you know, the Bush-Gore differential nationally, you needed really to be tracking uh, 50 or 51 numbers, and truth be told, only about 12, because there's only 12 states that really matter. Um, and, we, and we learned that again in 2016, right? So Hillary Clinton suffered the same fate, one, and, and, even, and by the biggest mismatch we've ever seen, right? Uh, and so it's, it's re-emphasized uh, that, oh, wow, we need, how are we going to repurpose these national samples, and where are we going to get good state-level estimates? That was really the genesis of this and, and made it take off, because now there's all these numbers to track, and it's not just one horse race, but there's 50 horse races, or really only 12. And, uh, and that's really how America and American media in particular really got sold on this as being an interesting problem. Uh, and, um, and a lot of work for, um, um, for um, people that know just enough statistics to be dangerous. Uh, <laughs> um, although um, I got out of that racket, as I'll, as I'll explain in a moment. So in 2012, I had a consulting gig at Huffington Post taking methodology that I'd been playing with in my office at Stanford when I wasn't doing other more serious things like, you know, political science, and this is sort of a more horse race tracking, and yeah, I know, you know, we've got machinery that can do that, and I've sort of known more about it than a lot of other political scientists. And so Huffington Post came to me and said, hey, stop playing in your basement with this stuff, come, come and do it with us. And I said, how much money do you have? And they said, nothing. And my wife said, never do that again. Uh, so I've never done it again, because it is dangerous to your mental health and to your marriage, to people around you, when you're involved in such high pressure, public facing work like this. It's, the scrutiny on this is, is crazy. Um, and it's one reason I stopped doing it. Um, the risk to reward, given that Nate had taken all the, all the reward, uh, was, was pretty low. But in any event, in 2012, we did very, very well. Using the methods I'm about to show you, we were able to predict um, the result in 51 out of 50, so 50 states plus the District of Columbia, and everybody had a nice victory lap. Right? So the Chronicle of Education, oh my, who are these people? What did they do? They nailed it, yeah, wow. And, and the truth is 2012 was the perfect time to be doing this because Obama was up for re-election, and it wasn't that different to a rerun of the 28 election. So we had all, as statisticians know, T minus one is usually a pretty good predictor of T <laughs> for slow moving stochastic processes. Not only did we know that, but the campaigns knew that too. And were essentially using the same turnout models and whatnot, and so were the pollsters. And so getting 51 out of 51 was no mean feat. Florida was a knife edge call, but the polls did very well. Hence, the poll aggregators, such as myself, did very well. And there was a lot of high-fiving and victory lapping uh, afterwards. Um, meanwhile, in my household, you will never do that again and take that much time away from me and the kids. And OK, OK, OK. So, so lesson learned. So, so um, 
Um, I got out of that racket, um, and that was pretty good timing because 2016 was a bit of a train wreck, uh, as, as, as we'll talk about in a moment. So the, the, pub, the public interest in, in this work is, is, is immense, and I'll, I'll come back to that consistent with the theme of the lecture series this year. But let me just tell you what I'm going to do. Um, this is a statistics audience, so I will do a little statistics uh, theory and methods on how this stuff works, a quick look under the hood, at least for the simple case. Um, I'll talk about these things called house effects. Uh, these are the biases specific to individual pollsters. Um, not, and I wanted to think, Nate Silver and myself, well, I actually am a pollster from time to time, but when you're, you, poll aggregators are seldom pollsters. A pollster is someone that actually runs or commissions public opinion polls. So I want to, we'll get into that a little bit. I'll talk about some extensions, and we haven't got a ton of time for that. I'll just sort of hand wave at those, really, more than anything. Um, a little bit of model criticism and some observations. But let me begin by observing that polls are like radar as it existed around about World War II. So that's what radar kind of looked like as physical things. Um, but think of the an analogues between the two, between polls and, and radar, at least 1940s, 50s era radar. You've got a noisy sensor. It's noisy. A pole is noisy because it comes equipped with sampling error. Um, it's probably also biased for reasons we'll get into in a moment. So um, a so-called house effects. So imagine a radar uh, unit that was sort of tracking targets but with systematically five degrees off, right? Or something like that, say. Um, there's limited resolution. Uh, and that is when you're a poll aggregator, not a pollster, you're seeing the published, you're a secondary analyzer of data. You're not seeing the, the raw micro data. You're like everybody else seeing the top line. 52, 48 on n equals 600. Those are the sufficient statistics. You don't see the multinomial outcome. You see this aggregator thing, typically integer rounded to percentage is sort of the norm in the industry. So. As it turns out, that error, that coarsening error um, from rounding to integers as in published poll rule is, is small relative to sampling error. So we typically don't worry too much about that. The key thing is that they're a snapshot. It's like the radar beam swings around, sees the target, and then swings off it again. And that's like the field period for a poll. The poll comes up, it's live, and then it stops. Right? And we're in the field between Friday and Sunday, and it goes into the paper on the Monday morning. Right, so it's, you're getting at best 24 hours old, but somewhere between 72 to 24 hours old by the time it's in the public domain. And then the other thing is the underlying tra target you're tracking, it's moving in continuous time, but with what law of motion? Mm, uh, well, that ain't, you know, who knows? No one knows. Right? And so there will be assumptions um, um, on this. And it, it's certainly not you know, a, a, a re-entry vehicle on a ballistic trajectory or something like that. It's, it, it's something else, but we'll make assumptions um, about that. So, so those are the, um, some analogs between, this is a, 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 a target, a signal, you can think of it as a signal processing problem. Uh, and indeed, you know, as, as many of you in the room will know, there are all these points of connection between things that were going on of interest to, say, the military and the space program and technologies that we now have. And I'm going to use two uh, Monte Carlo methods that come straight from uh, the Manhattan Project um, and, uh, and uh, the Kalman filter, uh, which comes from the Apollo program and, and missile tracking uh, of the mid-20th century. Um, oh, and there's another observation is that when we're in the case of tracking, um, um, rather than tracking a formation of planes or targets flying in, 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 in proximity to one another, it's like um, for, for the multi-target case, or a multi-candidate election, public opinion, vote intentions have to sum to unity. Right? So you've got this, it's a Dirichlet problem or a, or a Pi problem or a stick breaking problem, if you will. And, and you've got some dependencies there. So if someone's vote share goes up, it's almost certain you know, someone else's vote share has, has gone down. There could, could be positive correlations among proximate parties. And, so it gets messy pretty quickly um, um, once, you're, 
in, in the multiple target case, and we'll, and we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. So just for the scalar target, which is a single scalar quantity that we're tracking, vote share for party X over time. Uh, we'll let T index the campaign days, and poll P is fielded on day T, and we'll just, we'll, we'll just hold a poll. A poll is on a day, and typically the, in my group, what we do is take the floor of the median of the start date and the end date. And we've done other things like allocating the sample over the field period, but, but um, just, we'll just keep it simple. The poll is in, a, in the field on a day, T. And we typically use days. Um, you could use weeks. There's nothing you know, written in stone that says you have to use days, but this is typically the way we work. So poll P is filled in on day T by polling company J. And, and we're going to just say the scalar case, and we get a number. And uh, newspapers like percentages, but we'll, we'll use proportions. And, um, and it comes with a sample size N. Um, and sometimes the paper won't even give you that. You've got to phone around. What was the sample size? They won't even give you that. Um, um, but anyway, and we'll use a crude, you know, pretty good actually approximation to the variance of that. Um, just the Y1 minus Y over N <coughs> approximation of the variance. And, and so all that's observed. That, that's the observed um, data. But we're interested in true latent voting intention, Xi, and they too, for the scalar case, live on the unit interval. And occasionally we get to observe them without error on election day. Now, assuming, well, and potentially is a big, no voter fraud, right? Right? But we'll assume that when the in my case, the Australian Electoral Commission or the, the, the Secretaries of State in the various American states or, or, or Elections NZ or whoever, um, that's the result. If you were surveying perfectly on that day, you should have hit that number. Um, so it's an interesting problem. If we want to go back to the signal processing or target tracking problem, it's like we know the launch site and we know the impact site. And now can we reconstruct a trajectory and given that, can we then back calibrate how crappy were our radar installations? So it's, it's kind of that in, a bit of an inverse, which was actually a real problem <laughs> that people worked on uh, in, in World War II. Um, everything old is, uh, uh, is new again. Um, now, just to um, parameterize this idea to make this a little more formal, <clears throat> the idea that um, we've got a bias sensor we say that the, what the polling company sees is not the truth. It sees the truth plus its in-house error, this delta that's indexed by J for the, whoever did the Peeth poll. Right, so I'm pollster J, and I'm carrying around bias delta. Okay. Now, where could that bias come from? Well, it could be the way I pull my samples, if I pull samples at all, by the way, if I'm not just sort of hanging out a shingle and having people come to my website. Right? So there's a random digit dial, there's a landline mobile mix, am I quotering up from a web panel, people are pre-recruited, or is it just over the transom, people arriving at a website? What is it? And that varies across different uh, polling companies. How do I weight the data ex post? Um, it, both the procedure, the algorithm, but also the variables that go into the algorithm. Do I rake um, using the survey package, <laughs> um, or, or, do I, um, or, or do I do propensity score matching, or, or something else? Right? There's lots of choices to, be, to make there, and probably more interestingly, particularly in the United States, um, around what is the electorate that you think will show up and vote on, on voting day. Uh, trying to get a, a weight back to a sample of, of uh, the likely electorate, not the people that took your survey. Survey mode matters. Is it live interviewer? Is it IVR? That's a robo polling. Or is it self complete? People are just arriving at a website and taking the survey themselves, presuming they can do that. They can read English. Did you administer the survey in different languages? All, all those sorts of choices that you make uh, when you do the survey. There are real differences depending on what you're interviewing about between live interviewer and, and more anonymous modes of survey completion, particularly in the United States, particularly around issues that may prime race. 
right? A black respondent talking to a black interviewer, white respondent, white, you can, all the pairings there about respondent and interviewer race, as inferred from tone of voice and accent and whatnot. Um, um, could go on about that, but I, but I won't. Question wording, how do you ask that? How, if an election were held today, or in the election coming up in November, right, there's just different cues, different ways you ask the question, but more critically, do you list all the options? Or if people want to vote for a minor party, do they have to fish around and present that themselves? You know, you just list the majors, you don't list the minors and independents. Or what do you do about DKs? Did you push them? Okay, I know you said don't know, but if you had to guess, or if you had to say, it, who do you vote for? Do you do that or not? All these choices that are going on uh, under the hood. And then field operations, time of day, um, we sample on a weekend, well, let's say younger people, da 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 da. Um, all these sorts of considerations that go on literally in the sausage making. And I'm going to make a heroic assumption that these things are constant for a, they're time invariant. They're an attribute of the way a polling company does business. That's largely the case, um, um, but, but probably not. Um, and moreover, I'm bundling all of that into just that one parameter, because I don't get to really observe this. Right? So that delta parameter is a, as we say in economics, a fixed effect. Uh, it's capturing all that sort of, all those choices specific to a given polling company that leads them to produce numbers that differ systematically from the truth by delta. Some deltas could be positive, some deltas could be negative. Right? Everybody's delta may be positive. Everybody's overestimating or, or underestimating, right? There's nothing magic about um, the, you know, mandates still, the, the polls get it right. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And we'd like to estimate that. All of this, of course, is compounded when we're in low voter turnout or uncertain voter turnout environments. And, and um, I tell Australian pollsters, you should kiss the soil for compulsory voting. Just worship God above. Uh, it, makes, it makes polling, election polling in Australia, a lot easier. Uh, that and a census, um, reasonably good census, um, uh, every, uh, not every decade, more frequently than that, every five years in Australia. Um. Okay, so now, what's the model that we're going to use to um, recover that? And I call it a state space model because that's what, these things, depending on where you go in the sciences, in economics, all the way through to engineering and and, and, and statistics and CS sort of sitting in between. Different names are basically the same thing. Um, economists sometimes refer to this as a state space model um, and because economics is typically next to political science and the academic phone book. Um, that's, that's how I, I came to learn it. But, but um, effectively we've got two equations. One, a model relating the unknown stuff uh, in orange to the observed stuff in blue. Uh, so we have this observed poll, YP, uh, and for a reasonable size sample, um, a normal law is plausible, uh, as is the approximation for the variance. But remember our model for the mean there, we're going to say we've got truth, Greek letter xi, plus bias, Greek letter delta. Right? And then this thing's got to move over time, right? We've got to, and so I'm going to make just the dumbest assumption I can make, and it's a random, it's, a, it's Gaussian random walk. Right. And if I've got endpoint constraints, I'll use them and I'll show you with them on and with them off. Um, you can, of course, fit other dynamic models. Uh, so this is a locally constant model, right? The expected value of xi today is just the expected value of, is, is what it was yesterday. Right? So we call that locally constant. You can have a locally linear trend model that asks a bit more of the data. There are two uh, dynamic processes that work for that. And, and these data are actually pretty sparse. Um, even in the United States, where it looks like there's a ton of pollen, the ability to estimate this down at the da daily level starts to, plus the house effects, it, it, you're really asking a lot of the observed data. Um, um, this is not radar <laughs> giving you sweeps uh, uh, regularly and, and with high precision. Uh, low precision sweeps every now and then from different sensors with different levels of bias. And, and so fitting a fancy dynamic model um, just asks more of the data than occasionally I've found it useful to fit a local 
trend, uh, linear trend model. Um, um, but, but what I do, um, I'll, come, I'll come to one nice little elaboration in, in just a moment. Oh, I guess the other thing I should say for the eagle-eyed in the audience, right, we've got, it's homogenous as well. We're, we're assuming that's constant variance. So the innovation variance on this process is constant. And if you know a little bit about politics, you might go, well, does that make sense, Simon? Um, you know, politics is very quiet in the year just after the last election and not much going on. And then it goes into, look at the United States, well, perhaps not a good example recently, but, but, but typically what happens is when the campaign is on and in parliamentary systems, the election has been called and now we have fixed terms in most places, so the drama has gone out of that too to some extent. But in any event, as the election gets near, date known or unknown, ex ante, um, campaigning starts and it might be reasonable to assume that the level of omega in a campaign period is greater than a level of omega in a quiescent period where people are more interested in footy and, and whatnot than they might be in, in, in politics. And that's a reasonable assumption, but again, pushing hard, this is all unobserved and you know, we're asking a lot of just this stream of data here. And so I'm just showing you the simple case uh, for now. So what do we want to get? We're going to use the observed stuff to estimate the unobserved stuff. Um, we want to recover that sequence um, of size um, um, and perhaps with the two endpoints observed. Um, we want to estimate house effects and we'd like to estimate that innovation uh, variance and, or standard deviation omega um, as well. <coughs> so how are we going to do that? Um, oh, and one last observation. Yeah, the dynamic model, um, one thing we, we do, do, where we know there was a day where a lot happened, and in Australia, um, since they decapitate prime ministers about every 11 months or so, those are big days of drama. So when you go to a new leader, what we can do is, ah, on that day, there's a step function of unknown magnitude, but we just know on that day, there's a, there's a step of unknown magnitude gamma. And, and, we, and we estimate that. We can do that. The more you know, fancy, if this were you know, a little bit more non-parametric, well, every day is potentially one of those, and it's some Gaussian process, and da-da-da-da-da process over there. Right? You might go down that rabbit hole. Um, again, it's not like there's a lot of data here um, to, 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 to do that. Um, but that would be kind of the more 21st century and less mid-20th century version of, um, of this model, and have at it. Um, um, uh, would, be, would be a cool, cool project. Um, um, if you want to see it as a DAG, uh, that's what it looks like as a DAG, a, d a directed acyclic graph, that's often a more convenient representation than, than the equations for some people. But we've got this latent process and the unknown things are in circles and the observed stuff sits in a, in a box and, and, and that's essentially we're trying to use boxes to learn about circles given the dependency relations encoded in the graph, uh, the conditional independence relations. It tells you if you were to try and write a, um, a Gibbs sample for this problem from scratch, what the conditionals would be. It's a great, great thing about seeing your model uh, as a directed acyclic graph. Um, there's one thing, again, I'm sure eagle-eyed people in the audience may have noticed, as written, the model's over-parameterized. Um, if that's my model for the observed stuff, then um, one number equals the sum of two unknown numbers. Oh, do tell. Uh, how does that work? Uh, well, it doesn't work is the answer. That's observationally indistinguishable from a family, an infinite family of imposter models, if you will, where I could shift the latent trajectory up by some quantity c and shift the house effects all down by the same quantity c, and the data can't tell me the difference between that. So what to do? Well, that's where the endpoint constraints become valuable. That thing is now, we've got a rigid body problem now, if you will. That trajectory, right, we know where it was on that date, we know where it was on that date, and now we've got this trajectory here, but the model is really telling the, the, the house effects now are identified, as we say, um, uh, and we can recover the trajectory. If you don't have the endpoint constraints, and that's an interesting um, position to be in, sometimes you pick up, um, um, for instance, the Iowa caucuses. 
13 candidates who are running. Well, what did they get? Well, it's a different field than last time, and we haven't got, we're in real time, we haven't got the result yet. Um, or you're tracking something where there will never be that rec presidential approval. What's, when, you know, it's a great thing to poll on because you'll never be found wrong. Right, right, one of these things. Um, um, so what to do in that case? Well, in that case, we, we just drop the, the rank, if you will, of, of, of delta. Um, and, and so what I typically do is a sum to zero normalization on the deltas so that the average house effect is zero, if you will. Um, and, and if you want to think about that, what are you doing when you do that? You're saying, basically, you're asserting that collectively the polls are unbiased, which may or may not be true, by the way, but that's it, what the assumption amounts to. I guess a little more technically, you can say, I'm recovering this Xi series up to a translation equal to the average bias that I don't know of, of the pollsters. But it's, a, it's just another way to sort of do this uh, in real time. It's great. Um, we're all excellent forecasters after the fact. Uh, fitting these trajectories when you know where it was supposed to be uh, is much easier um, uh, than fitting them um, before you've seen um, where the trajectory uh, winds up. So those are the choices you're making, how to identify this thing. Or alternatively, you know, say, I'm not really interested in delta. Throw them away. I mean, that's right. That's up to you. And if, if you want my experiences, there's a lot of evidence suggests that the polls are um, over dispersed, but perhaps not as over dispersed as they should be. Uh, and we'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a moment as well. Um, uh, over dispersed across polling houses. Okay. So um, estimation and inference now, and this will finish off a little bit more stats and then we'll get into an application. Um, uh, if, if we adopt the Gaussian model, that's great. We're in Kalman filter land. Uh, it's a nice place to be. Everything's nice and linear uh, in terms of figuring out the, the step ahead forecasts, uh, filtering and then back smoothing um, is, is, is straightforward. So too is a fully Bayesian approach, coding up a Gibbs sampler for that case um, under, under Gaussianity is, is, um, is, is is easy, at least it's easy to derive what the, <laughs> what the, uh, what the steps are, uh, coding it up and making it run fast is, a, is, another, is another trick. Um, uh, different names for these things in different places. In Bayesian statistics, this is sometimes called a DLM, a dynamic linear model. Um, Mike West um, 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 has, a, has a big, big book, a uh, big Springer book on, on, on that. Um, um, as computer science rediscovers statistics, uh, um, new names come in, hidden Markov or partially observed Markov models. Um, um, but um, my experience has been that there are a ton of Kalman filtering packages in R and even a few DLM packages, but the presence of the house effects and the identification restrictions I have to put on those typically make the off-the-shelf algorithms um, not really work for my purposes. Um, this is not like the Nile River data where you observe it every year and, and, um, and it's one thing, I've got different sensors and you know, it's a little closer to an engineering problem than it is a sort of a toy problem you'd, you show your students when you teach them Kalman filtering. So, um, um, so my history with the computing of this is um, uh, painful. Um, uh, EM or MCMC uh, prototyping in R, and then when I'm feeling especially masochistic, trying to make things run faster with C and C++. Um, and then or handing it off to general purpose Bayesian machinery, um, black boxes, um, like JAGs, and that's what I used in my Bayesian textbook uh, about oh, 11 years ago now. Um, um, uh, Stan is sort of um, the go-to Bayesian can opener these days, and so and that's fine for a, a, a lot of these things. Um, very quickly, though, as soon as you start elaborating the model, I find Stan, um, as quick as it is, runs like treacle uh, on, on these sorts of problems. Uh, and, and I've come to be um, much more um, enamored with our packages uh, nimble, 
and, and POMP for partially observed Markov uh, processes. These are packages. Nimble in particular has some, um, uh, it, it's bugs or jags or stand like, um, but understands, oh, this is, a, uh, this is a dynamic filtering problem. Oh, we have tools for that that are a little more problem specific and hence there's a bit more computational grunt there. And it's my kind of uh, saber of choice at the moment for, for, for these sorts of uh, problems, particularly when we get away from the Gaussian case, um, if we're in Dirichlet multinomial um, land instead of, um, which I'll come to in a second. Um, give you an example. Um, this is the last Australian federal election. Um, 226 polls over uh, 1,051 days between the 2016 and 2019 election, fielded by six distinct pollsters. Uh, I'm going to augment the model with a discontinuity when Scott Morrison um, replaces uh, Malcolm Turnbull as PM. That was a jump day. And I don't know the size of the jump, but I just know, um, I'm, you know we, had a, we had some movement. And all that. Or at least that's a hypothesis. We'll let the data tell us what's we'll estimated from the data. Uh, and, and I estimate this separately for different scale of targets. Now, they should all sum to one across the targets, but I don't impo I just to keep things simple, uh, to, for this example at least, for this talk for now, um, just do it this way. Uh, and, and we had one pulse that gave us a ton of data. You can see the, the, the imbalance here, right? Ipsos had 18 polls, and that's kind of scrolling off the bottom, but um, I think there's another pulse there. Yeah, YouGov gave us 12, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and here's the tail of the tape. So you get, um, this is time obviously running along here. Here are individual polls. And um, you see the dispersion is pretty big. Um, um, and you can see the integer, see the banding? That's the integer rounding and the reporting. They all line up on different points. But um, the white line is what we get when we fit the model ex post. So we've, it lands as it must on the 2019 result for labor, right? Because it's constrained to do that. And it starts on the 2016 result and, and, and runs. Uh, that's the white. No, and, I, and I get to fit that model because I got my two endpoint constraints after the election. Right? That's easy forecasting. Right? Right. This is the model. The gray line, though, is what you get if you say sum to zero. I know where we started. I don't know the biases of these pollsters, so I'll just assume collectively they're unbiased. Some are biased up, some are biased down collectively. But, but if you made that assumption, not much of a triumph of the quants there. Right? You're overestimating labor vote share. You're saying they get a small swing towards them relative to their 2016 result, when in fact they actually got about um, almost a two-point swing away from them. So there's nothing magic about these algorithms that somehow makes pollster bias go away. Right? You're poll aggregating. If you've got a bunch of biased polls, aggregating a bunch of biased stuff gives you a biased thing, theorem. <laughs> um, um, and there's the discontinuity for Morrison, that little, that's one day. Um, and, um, and I should be able to drag this in. It's not going to let you do it, is it? Right. Oh, well, that's a shame. Oh, there it is. Come on. Oh. I'm meant to be able to drag this, but it's not letting me do it for some reason. But, oh, there we go. There we go. You can see the jump in the campaign period a little. So there's basically the tenure um, of, of Morrison's prime ministership. Labor got a, a little bump when he came in. Um, and, but the polls are all up here. We know ex post that they landed there, uh, but these polls are, have got them all up there. Um, here are the Greens in Australia. And again, you know, when, when you're polling that green vote share in Australia, you should report one of three numbers, uh, 9, 10, or 11. <laughs> and that'll be $50,000. Thanks very much. I'm going to say 10. 10. 10. Very good. Uh, 
But you can see there are some polls have got it up at 15s. And, um, and again, most of the industry tends that there's a bit of an overestimation, um, typically of a green vote in Australia. It's funny, you think pollsters would know this and try and, uh, what are we doing? But, but it seems, this one seems to hang in there a little bit. The really striking one is in Australia, the two party preferred number, as we call it, uh, back over there. And, and again, this is what the polls were saying. The cult, it was going to be a 52-48, or a 50, at best a 51-49 election with the coalition losing. And it turned out exactly the opposite. It was a 51-40. They, they, and they got the swing. So it's bad for the pollsters when you're on the wrong side of 50 in a two-horse race. That's bad. Which is really tough for statisticians, because the normal law of error does not sort of go off a <laughs> right? But, but, um, but this is sort of the, the, the perils of this work. But in particular, they got the swing wrong. Um, and, um, and um, you know, there's only one poll in the set that had, a, had them, you know, from way before the election, um, that had them uh, doing better than they actually did. Um, and then there's, you know, only one, two, if you take those four plus that five polls, had them improving on their 2016 position. Everybody else had a swing away from them. And there's the gray line is what we would have been fitting in real time with our sum to zero constraint, assuming the industry was unbiased. Uh, there's the discontinuity associated with going from Turnbull, who even with the biases kind of estimated and corrected out, Turnbull's support was falling, although in retrospect, it turns out he was better than, than they thought he was. Uh, but then they get rid of him. But then the really amazing thing is, at least according to this data and this model that we're fitting to it, this recovery of about two percentage points of, of vote share for the coalition over about a nine-month period. Um, um, and again, you look at that and you go, well, do you need a different law of motion for this period, at least the variance of the Gaussian random walk? And they're all good questions to ask. Um, because this is fully Bayesian, we've got credible bounds on, on everything. Um, and you can see that the difference between the two models, that when you fit with the endpoint constraints, this collapses. That, the posterior distribution on xi for day one and xi for day cap t is degenerate, collapses the point mass. And you can see sort of the confidence intervals, just you know, the, the, the head and the tail of the caterpillar right, collapsing down. Whereas here, I've only got the tail of the caterpillar and here, on election day, I don't know the result when I'm fitting this model, so I've got a bound of about 95% uh, bound there of about uh, plus or minus 0.8 of a percentage point, uh, because there's actually a fair amount of polling there. It's hard to see. You can see these bounds get a little wider over Christmas, New Year, when there's less polling in Australia. And then, and then when there's more polling, these things tighten up again a little bit. Um, um, but uh, that's great. We, we, so if you're using this in real time, and hence, you got, everything's on a probabilistic footing now. So you can say, you can actually start to make probability statements now that I've got posterior identities on things, not just point estimates. I can, I can report out the probability that this, you know, that this is above, well, the two-party preferred track is above or below 50, for instance, which is typically thought to be where you win an Australian election, about 50-50 two-party preferred. Um, I, I can report that out. And, and indeed, all the downstream quantities when you do this state by state in the United States, when you've got 51 of these things, the, the probability that someone wins a state is the probability that they take all those electoral college votes for that state. And so you can then aggregate that up and induce a probability mass function over the electoral college vote, which is discrete, right? It's the integers 0 through... Uh, um, <laughs> 538, um, with 270 being the magic number, and 271 being the magic number. Um, and, and there's, just to show you that we recover all that when we put this in the fully Bayesian machinery. Um, this model, um, you know, I did this in Stan. It literally runs in about 10 or 15 minutes, you know, 10,000 iterations you know, your, your friendly iPhone maker will also send you a laptop with, you know, four quad core, da-da-da-da-da. 
the fans run and the desk gets hot, but the thing's done in, in, in 15 minutes and, you know, as, as we all know, computing has come a long way. And it's R on the front end, hand off to, to Stan through R Stan, and R on the back end uh, for the graphs and, and, uh, and making a slide deck uh, these days as well. Um, other parameters we're interested in are the rate of change parameter, and this is the posterior density over the, the standard deviation of that. Um, time's getting tight, so I won't dwell on that. And then, of course, something we're enormously interested in are these pulsed biasy parameters. And you can see all of these were to the left of zero, uh, the underestimate of coalition two-party preferred vote share. And so we get point estimates, and these are just um, point-wise 95% credible intervals. Bit of a mixed picture, um, but typically, you know, most pollsters overestimating ALP primary vote share. Bit of a mixed picture for Greens. Here are some of the big overest overestimates I talked about. And then other, this is this was one of the crazy things of the last election in Australia. Um, people really unsure about the rise of minor parties, and you had this person, um, um, Clive Palmer, a gentleman in Australia who spent 60 million Australian of his own money. Um, and, and people really didn't know how to poll about him. YouGov asked, put him in the question. And if you, you know, theorem, if you give respondents an option, they're more likely to report it than if you don't, right? And so um, even though there were many seats where Palmer did not have a candidate up, right? And so, um, and, and similarly for One Nation and, and the, the minor parties, but there's a tremendous pressure on pollsters Oh, you're biasing the results towards the majors if you don't put, you know, give. There's a lot of people out there upset with the major parties, and you better be asking about the minors. And 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 a lot of it looks like overestimation, though. Um, uh, what's really amazing is that NewsPoll and YouGov, um, um, actually done now by the same survey house, just with different internal methodologies and a different, and that's sort of slowly being merged. Um, that's, that's kind of interesting in and of itself and um, makes for some interesting lunches with market researchers in Sydney uh, as to how, how that's happening. Um, but again, time's tight and I won't dwell on that. And there's the house effects um, for the, for the two-party preferred. Um, um, we can repeat this analysis over previous election cycles. Um, the house effects um, in orange for 2019 uh, uh, for this is for coalition two-party preferred, um, or for just the LNP. Oh, this might be for the LNP primary vote share. But in any event, they're quite distinctive relative to past years. Um, you can see some of these house effects are, are estimated with massive imprecision because a pollster shows up and does two polls. Right, and here's the other way to to to. Uh, escape this analysis with a house effect that's in this thing from zero, do a really small sample, right? As, as your sample size goes, goes up, I learn about your bias, right? And so it's a brave pollster that goes into the field with N equals 15,000 on election eve, right? You don't get to hide behind late swing or sampling error, right? No, N equals 400 will do us nicely, thanks. Plus, oh, we covered it. We're at the 95 bound. We were with, we, we, so th th that, and that's a real trade-off that, that, that I think um, some pollsters um, are all too aware of. And, and, but, but people like us has to, have to hold them to account. Um, um, and that turn gets me onto this topic where I'll end. Um, did the polls heard? Uh, and I got in trouble because sheep do not herd. Uh, uh, they flock, but anyway. Um, so, uh, what is herding and how can we detect it? Um, well, look, we understand the incentives for it. Uh, tremendous commercial implications follow from election polling um, because it's the one time as a market researcher, you're estimating something where the truth will out. It's not like presidential approval, 53. Mm -hmm. it's 50. Could it be 50? It could be. Uh, but if you're on the field with a big sample before election day, the extent you're wrong, we're going to see it. Um, 
Uh, and hence the incentive to just look over your shoulder as you're making those umpteen million choices in the sausage making must be irresistible. Um, um, and, and there were some real consequences. Um, uh, Fairfax, as they then were, um, dropped their contract with their pollster. They said, we've seen some. And Essential is not doing vote intention polling. There's one pollster in Australia doing vote intention at the moment. Uh, people are just so gun shy after 20, uh, 20, um, 2019. VC of ANU, Nobel laureate Brian Schmidt, had an op-ed going, well, I know about the central limit theorem. Uh, these poles are certainly not dispersed enough. Um, you know, and Brian's fast enough and, you know, call them. Um, and, and that's right. If you're a pollster, that's not good. <laughs> and Nobel laureates going after you. Um, and, and 538 looks at this all the time. And, and sometimes you can just eyeball it, watch the dots collapse on the trend line in the home stretch. Um, sometimes the interocular test of herding uh, is, is sometimes all you need. Um, a little more technically, herding should manifest as under dispersion. Um, we know that if you're surveying with simple random, unbiased simple random sampling for a population quantity pi with sample size n, we know the variance of your estimates should be pi 1 minus pi over n. And the question is, are they bigger or smaller than that in practice? All right. And so let's put the question of bias to one side for a moment, which is interesting because that's a source of over dispersion. If each pulse has got its own delta, um, what we want to do is now ask, well, are they sure that there's some, that's driving some dispersion, but is there still not enough dispersion? Um, and I'll, I'll just show you what I did. I assume that voting intentions don't change from the level we observe on election day. And, and that's probably not true given the, what I just showed you, um, at least for the coalition. And then what we do, I just take a neighbor, I just dial, I, I just march back through the poll history, you know, a moving window of D days, and then just look at the standard deviation of the polls um, field in that period um, and, and compare that with what um, you should see if people are out there polling with the sample sizes they say they have and also give them the benefit of the doubt that might come from rounding their results. And then we observe that empirical standard deviation relative to the simulated standard deviation. And how often do we see um, you know, the, the theoretically expected level of, of uh, dispersion greater than um, the, uh, the empirical? And, and that's the difference between the, the white line, the observed dispersion, the empirical dispersion, and, and the yellow is what we should see if, if the central limit theorem and, and no change in vote intentions held. And you can see for the coalition, two-party preferred, and for liberal national party vote shares, the, the white line is comfortably outside of the simulated you know, value. And, um, and so there's my little bootstrapped, not especially Bayesian uh, test of, um, uh, not especially Bayesian at all, uh, test of, um, of, um, of, of herding. Um, there are other ways to do that. I thought I'd leave it there. Very quickly, we can generalize this model I've shown you away from the scale of target uh, to cases where we're tracking multiple candidates. You know, now it's a pie that has to sum to one, and we're tracking the shares of the pie. Um, we can do that with the Dirichlet model, um, which is a now we're not in the Kalman filtering world, it's non-linear and we need some other technology. Another way that keeps us in the Gaussian world is to work with log odds of the, of, 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 um, of the shares and, 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 and that's not bad either. A bit of housekeeping, all the mapping from log odds back to proportions and whatnot and uh, some Jacobians floating around, but that's okay. Um, I just did a bit of work for CNN um, on the Iowa caucuses where you've got a huge number of candidates, not many polls, and some, and some people dropping out as well. And then Bloomberg drops in. So it really, that really does look like a signal tracking problem then, um, where all of a sudden there's a new target on the radar screen, and then some you took out and they've disappeared. And, and, and that was fun, M making this kind of technology work for, um, for that problem. Um, um, and then, of course, the work I did back in 2012 and swore I would never do again, at least 
not specifics, but, but tracking 51 of these things. And you've got this huge covariance matrix, um, and handling that thing is just a, a nightmare. Um, really, really tricky how to populate that thing and to, to keep it going. So one thing I learned is, OK, here I am. I'm a statistician. I've got these algorithms. I know identification and algorithms, and away I go. But the end user wants a forecast. To them, I think of it, I've just averaged the polls. To the punter out there consuming the it's Simon Jackman, Stanford professor or whatever, is making a forecast about the election. You go, whoa, is that what I'm doing? Oh, that's what I'm doing. It's not what I thought I was doing, but if people think that's what I'm doing and I'm hanging a shingle out in the public domain, that's what I'm doing. And that was a realization that really only hit me a week and a half before the 2012 election. And then very quickly, I, I had to engage in, OK, so how far off are these poll averages from historical results? Uh, and it turns out that follows a T distribution with like three or four degrees of freedom. <laughs> um, sometimes they're off by a lot. And then wrapping that last bit of uncertainty to actually make these a well-calibrated, uh, honest forecast was, Again, a real something I barely had enough time to do in 2012. But again, it was a great lesson to me as a public-facing social scientist that what you think you're doing with data may not be what the user, the consumer, thinks you're doing with the data. But once it's out there, particularly once you've signed a contract with a media organization, you've, you've gone down that road, you've really got an obligation, I think a, a professional, scientific, perhaps ethical obligation to to, to really make sure, A, you're putting out there what people expect, or you're doing your damnedest to walk it back. But in, in the fever pitch, the last 10 days of a US presidential election, no one's walking back anything. The Jackman forecast, the Huffington Post forecast, you go, whoa, oh, they think it's a forecast. I'm just averaging some polls. Oh, so, so with great public interest comes great power and great responsibility. You become a participant, not an observer. And there's some interesting papers out there that exposure to poll averages is changing people's propensity to vote. These things have become so popular that they're feeding back into the system. Right? If you show people, well, Nate Silver says Hillary Clinton's got a 95% or a 70% chance of winning, that's actually got measurable impacts on propensity to vote, both observational and experimental uh, uh, data on that, 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 um, that is really uh, quite compelling evidence of, of that behavior, um, particularly with the validation that comes from being, oh, it's not just one poll, but it's an average of the polls. Because people have learned, oh, don't believe any one poll, believe the average, look at the trend. And people have internalized that. The other thing is that we're chasing each other's tail, are they like, the thing that we heard to is the poll average now. It's pretty clear that there's some of that going on as well. Uh, as, as people like Nate and to a lesser extent some of the work I've done gets out there and is known. Um, so, and we have no way of unpicking that either. So um, these, these are things to be aware of uh, um, when, when you do this sort of work. And something I came to be aware of and, and um, one of the reasons I don't do this again, and I'm much more comfortable estimating properties of electoral systems, or doing this in an academic setting, and, and, um, and uh, doing my public-facing work um, on um, some of the work I did in, in, in expert witness work um, on, on electoral systems, um, which is a whole other story. But we're way late. I'm so sorry. But thank you. It was a great pleasure to give this talk tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much. We've got time for one or two questions. Peter. Uh, why do the house effects persist? Because surely, if you've got a house effect that's biased and you then get the wrong results, you surely modify your behaviour. That, that's right. Um, um, so I've seen the good side of this and the bad side of it. I'll do the bad side first. There are some pollsters out there who are signalling their partisan colour. So, uh, and the case that comes to mind in the United States is Rasmussen, who will get you a Republican plus three, typically, and he's dialed it back a little over time. 
because the rest of the time he wants consulting work for conservative clients and he's parading that credential. In Australia, the industry is reacting very positively, uh, very proactively to the errors re revealed. By, because they had a pretty good cycle in 16, uh, the Australian 16, and then a not so good cycle in 19. And something I've tried to understand, and again, there's only so much this data is going to reveal to you. Well, if they did well in 16, and they did pull in, when, in the, when did they go off, when did they go astray? And you, you can't date that. But yeah, um, pe people, the US case is harder as the electorate changes. Assumptions about who's going to show up and vote tend to be a big driver of the bias. In Australia, they're looking at things like sample composition, but critically, and, and weighting, uh, but critically, how you ask the question about minor parties, which seems to be a big source of bias. Just in the middle there. The um, one side obviously didn't like the pollsters. The media was, was say, fairly biased in one way against one group. How do you factor in, you know, what was described as the hidden Trump vote? People do, in your analogy, a flying stealth, you know, you can't detect, you don't want to talk to you. Um, you, you don't, right? I don't, right? Th this technology can't do that, right? This technology can only discover that ex post. Right? Um, same way that a, that a pollster can't, right, in real time. Pollsters like a poll aggregator learn about their biases when election day reveals them. In, in real time, um, there's nothing you can do about it. Now, that's one of the learnings from 16. Why was 12 was easy because of 8, right? And then people went, oh, 16, the 16 electorate's going to look a lot like the 12 electorate. T minus one will look a lot like T will look a lot like T minus one, except when it didn't, because of what Trump Trump mobilised people, particularly in the upper Midwest. Pollsters, I don't think are going to make that mistake again. They will assume that the Trump electorate in 20 will look a lot like the Trump electorate. In, so the question is, have they got the Dem side right in terms of turnout there? But um, often this is a lot like generals fighting the last war. Um, um, there's some real work to integrate it, polling with what you're seeing in social media to try and learn about enthusiasm as well. Um, but most of the polling industry, to the extent they rely on behavioral metrics at all, it's taking a respondent, and you can do this in the United States, I don't know if you can do it in NZ, um, the political parties can do this in Australia, because they have access to the electoral roll. Um, but I don't think they have access to whether you voted or not, and basically everybody votes in Australia, so it's kind of moot. But, but where I'm getting at, you can look at their voter history. Did this person vote in 16? Did this person vote in the midterm? Did this person vote in the primary? And actually estimating a propensity to vote model. And, and, and as eight predicted 12, and then people thought 12 would predict 16, except for this guy called Trump came along and broke the models. Right, I, I think because Trump's at the top of the ticket, I'm thinking that there's less room for that mistake. Again, it doesn't save you from it ex ante, but yeah. Okay, so we'll have to stop it here, but thank you very much, Professor Jackman. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, oh, and we, have a, we have a little gift. Thank you. Oh, is this what I, oh, so cool. I, I heard, I, I really, really psyched for this. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. That's great. This will be me in Auckland Airport tomorrow. Right, we have one final act, which is to uh, give away some t-shirts. So, so some people get those without having to do anything. Well. <laughs> Sorry about that. I still feel special. <laughs> If it, You're not um, going to take that away. So just to bring it back to R for a second, I, um, if you registered outside beforehand and gave us your, what, your name, your email and your t-shirt size, then you're in the draw. So we don't have something to pull uh, things out of, but um, so we usually get the speaker to do the draw. If you could just press enter. <laughs>
You want me to press it? Oh, very good. <coughs> right. <laughs> now, um, we don't actually have the T-shirts, so how this works <laughs> is I'm going to call some names out, and if you're here, if you could stand up, we'll clap you, and then you can sit down again. And we'll contact you about when we get a T-shirt for you. All right, so uh, number 12 is uh, Nick Bayliss. Is Nick Bayliss here? Oh, by the way, the rules are that you have to be here to collect. Oh, we need to sample some oh, more. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do the 17. Tom uh, Shearer? All right, Tom. Well done. And 33, Yijin Ko? All right, another winner. One more. We need one? Yeah, please. We just... Yeah, just... Uh, just do it again? Can you drive us? No. Or just one? Yeah. Just one. All right. And hopefully we don't reset. Seven. Thank you. Is... Two problems. Uh, Cha Seaton? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, happy winner. Thank you again, Simon. That's very cute. That's very cute. And um, next Wednesday, we have our next talk, so I hope to see... Is that Jennifer Hill? It is. Yes. That's correct. Well done. Yes. I, I, yeah. Come back it's Wednesday, that. nine days from... Yeah, next Wednesday in the sense that Wednesday next week. Uh, sorry, yes. Yes. Not this Wednesday, not, not two days' time, but uh, seven days after that, not seven days after today. <laughs> it's a Wednesday. It's next week. Hope to see you then. Thank you.